I'd like to call to order the seventh regular meeting of the 2017-2018 Common Council. I ask the clerk to please read the uh, uh, words for today. Thank you, Mayor. The two words, information and communication, are often used interchangeably, but they signify quite different things. Information is giving out, communication is getting through. Thank you very much. Would you please call the roll? There are 15 present. And Alderperson Schneider is uh, excused. I'm sorry, there are 14 present. And Alderperson Damro is also excused. Um, at this time, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I'd like to call for a moment of silence. One of our uh, firefighters' families had a big loss on June uh, 19th. Pasha Molitor passed away. Uh, he died from injuries in a car crash, and he was the son of Captain Ken Molitor and his wife, Lori. Thank you. Next, we'll move on to approval of the minutes from our last meeting. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to approve. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Next item is a presentation tonight on the Sheboygan Business Park expansion by Representative Rukert Milkey, the consultant that we hired for this project. Chad will open up. Thank you. So you'll recall that the council approved a document to hire Rukert Milkey to assist the city in doing a feasibility study on the future expansion of the Sheboygan Business Center. <coughs> Um, so uh, Joe Eberly from Rukert Milky is the project lead and he's going to run you uh, through a couple PowerPoint slides about uh, what has come up as part of that final plan and what the preferred concept looks like um, and then kind of the timeline moving forward. So with that, I'll turn it over to Joe to um, go through the PowerPoint. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Alderman. Um, my name, as Chad said, is Joe Eberly. Uh, we've been working on this study since um, <coughs> April of this year. Um, we've worked with a group uh, by the name of Hitchcock Design Group who are planners on this study, and we finished it about a month or so ago. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'm just going to, and I, I promise you I don't have 500 PowerPoint slides tonight on July 3rd to put you through, so I will get through this. Uh, I just want to talk about some highlights on this thing so that you can see what we came up with and what we're recommending. Um, just as a bit, little bit of a background, as you well know, uh, the existing business center is essentially full. Uh, there's very little room left in there. Uh, the city uh, adopted uh, strategic plan calls for construction in the beginning and expansion in 2018. That was the impetus for us to be retained to look at some options for the business center expansion. Um, the other thing that's not just unique to Sheboygan, in Sheboygan County there are no sites available right now that are of what we call sizable sites, 15 acres or more. So there, there's a need for that type of thing in the county right now. Um, the proposed site that we're talking about is, is really very special. You can see on these boards that I brought along and it's also in your copy of, your, of the pack that we have here. It, it's a very unique site and it's really special. I, I'm really excited about it from the standpoint that it is the front door to the city. People traveling, whether it's businesses or just <coughs> individuals traveling on I-43, really don't see 
Sheboygan. They don't see what you have downtown here or something like that. They see the interchange when they built the I, they put it out there on the west side of this whole thing. But when you drive from the, especially from the south, you come up over and you see this piece of property and it's, it's like the front door of the city. Uh, it, it's, it's really a magnificent tract of land. Uh, you've got Loves that just opened a couple of weeks ago on the south end of this thing, but it goes up to your existing business center. But I think this presents the city with a great opportunity. It, it's, you know, whether you, whatever you end up calling it, whether it's just continues to be called the Sheboygan Business Center, you call it the Gateway Center or something like that, but it really is the front door to the city. And this is the most visible piece of property. It's along I-43 right now. Um, next, please. The, the site, and when I say site, we're, from a planning standpoint, regardless of property ownership or municipal boundaries, it's like we look at a large, what the planning area should be, and it runs essentially from the OKV intersection all the way up to the existing <coughs> business park that's up there right now. So we look at the whole thing as a piece from planning purposes. I-43 on the west side and OK and, and Business Center Drive on the east side. Um, it, there's some other advantages of the site. The site for all intents and purposes is devoid of major wetlands and navigable streams which helps the development uh, as it goes forward if the city decides to move forward on this thing. It also lowers the cost. It allows for more developable acres and that's really obviously what you guys and ladies want is you want to have the most land, the most, the highest yield. In other words, if you have 100 acres, you don't want to put 30 of it in the streets and all the rest of this stuff that you can't build development on, can't provide jobs for and something like that. The other thing that we did and over the, the series of months that we worked on this and we received an awful lot of input from staff, we went back and forth with staff to make sure that what we were thinking and coming up with as realistically outsiders was something that the staff who know this area better than than we do makes sense on the whole thing. The main thing when you do business parks, and I've been doing these for quite a while. I've been at Ricker and Milky for, this is my 38th year. As I always say, I used to be young and tall and skinny, and you see what happens to you after 38 years. Um, you want to have a, a business park that's as flexible as possible because you can't assume what's going to come knocking on your door. One person may come in there and they want two or three or five acres. Somebody else would come in there and they want 50 acres on the whole thing. And at the end of the day, what you're really starting out with, for analogy, is a pie. And you have to carve this pie up and you have to be able to make sure that if somebody wants a big slice of pie that you've got the availability for it, but at the same time, there's enough flexibility in the plan that you can have little pieces of pie on the whole thing and you can combine them when you put the improvements in there so it's flexible, so that as you market this property in the future, um, that you don't, you don't carve it up. I've seen some municipalities, they put a track together, a rectangular piece of property, and they just slice and dice the whole thing, and they got all these fights. It, it doesn't work that way. You, you need to have flexibility, so when it's marketed, whether by you or the Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation, that they've got the flexibility to show prospective users. And this plan, um, I will say, from my perspective, is very flexible. You'll see on here, and you can I'm going to leave these here tonight so you can take a look at them, but you'll see that we have tentatively laid out some lots on this thing around the proposed street network, but at the same time, you can combine these, you can cut them in pieces, you can do anything else so that it works in there. And like I said, you cannot really predict what's going to be coming. What you want to have is, is the flexibility on the whole thing. <clears throat> the other thing we looked at was that based upon our experience, users of business parks, industrial parks, transportation is a really big thing. Uh, they make widgets, they're sitting on their dock. They don't make any money sitting on their dock. They need to get that stuff to wherever the end user is going to be or the distribution center. And minutes make a difference. 
I was involved with a project in the Milwaukee area where the site that was selected by the manufacturer over another one was because they were five minutes faster to the freeway than they were on the second site. Minutes cost money because once you get that stuff loaded in the truck, you got to get it the heck out of there and get to wherever it's going to go so they can get paid. That's really what it is. The other thing is is that you want to make sure that it's access that's easy for the employees and the, or if it's clients, if it's office buildings and that so you can get people in and out of there without going through a maze. This pr property is, has a huge advantage from the intersection that's down on the south end because it's really quick to get down there. If you had to go north to the next intersection up on Washington, you've got to go through the business park, you've got to deal with a railroad, and you've got to twist and go through the streets. It's fine for the existing business center, but to run all this traffic through there is going to be a big problem for potential users in the future. But they can run right down here to the south, and they're right on the freeway, go north or south, wherever they've got to go. The other thing is, uh, and this is based upon doing a number of these over the years. Developers and people who are, want to move into some new facility, whether it's Sheboygan or someplace else, they want to have, it's a trite saying, but shovel-ready ground. They don't want to hear, yes, we're going to build this park and it's going to be really great and someday we're going to have streets, we're going to have sewer, we're going to have water, and we're going to have the site great. They don't want to hear that. When the hierarchy at a company decide that they want to do something, they are extremely impatient. I'm sure you guys have dealt with this over the years. They want to be able to get done that you're not the impediment to what the CEO wants to build his big, magnificent building out in through there. They want to know that you've got that land available, the stuff is there, and, it, and in reality, it's going to take them longer to get through the approval process and everything else than it is once you have developable land. So that's another <coughs> key point on business parks. Um, uh, another good advantage of business parks, that really good ones that are very attractive, are a couple of things. Number one is you need to have a decent set of protective covenants. If I'm going to go out there and I'm, I make widgets and I'm going to build my $20 million plant, I want to make sure that somebody isn't going to build next to me in a grass ha hut. I mean, that, I realize that's an exaggeration, but I have an investment. My shareholders have an investment in this thing. They want to know that whoever's going to build next to them or across the street has got the same quality of development or better than what they've got because they're, these facilities that are built will probably outlive them and everything else, but that's what they have to, their board of directors or shareholders have to account to them for. Um, the streets obviously have to be wide enough to work with without taking too much right away up. Again, you want to maximize yield. In other words, if you have 100 acres, you want to be able to sell as, and develop as much <coughs> as the, of those acres as possible, but at the same time, you have to have streets wide enough to move WB-55s, that's a 53-foot trailer with a, with a tractor on the front end. Those things are huge, and they're not going to get smaller. And they, when you pull out of a driveway, they got, they'll be out into the other lane. That's the way that it is. But you have to, when you put medians down streets, as an example, you'll never know where the driveways are going to be. And then these things to try and turn to the left, to the right, and then do a U-turn and go back. They just don't work that way. They, they don't make Tonka trucks to work that way in the whole thing. So that's something that's got to get done. Um, Stormwater management is a big deal. Um, the first thing that goes on when you start developing one of these things, you have to put in the stormwater ponds because it's not only just common sense, but it's, it's good practice and it's also the, the DNR requirement so that as you're grading, you've got some place for the stormwater to go. And what's going to happen most likely in your park, as it does in almost every park, and I've been involved with 20 of them, um, those are the first things that are going to go in, and they, they, the initial ones may be temporary until you can expand the park and you put the permanent ones in. But um, the other thing is um, Sheboygan has uh, the same types of things that our other communities have, maybe at some points in time a little bit more, and that's attracting help. 
whether it's assembly line help or executives or administrative or professional people, they like to have things that are there because they're in these buildings all day long. The park that we're in down in uh, the city of Pewaukee, as an example, uh, <clears throat> it was not designed by us, it was not planned by us. There's no sidewalks in that business park. There's no walking path. And when weather's like today, when it's really nice out, when it comes to be the lunch hour, which is usually from about 11 to 1, depending upon with the various businesses in there, everybody's out walking in the streets. And there's semis coming around the corners and that. It's just not good. And it scares the kajibers out of the people and the truck drivers and everything else. What we've got shown on here is a path uh, that's going to be incorporated around um, some of the stormwater facilities slash parks, but there's also one throughout there. So people have got some place to go, even if it's in the middle of the day to get a break to get out to do that. But it's those type of amenities that help attract employees to these facilities. Next, please. Um, even your business park most likely would be phased. Most business parks are phased. There's quite a bit of land out there through there and you, and you will be developing a financial plan obviously at some point in time if this goes forward. But even though the park is gonna be phased, it's gotta be planned as a whole so that when you put all the pieces and parts of the jigsaw together, they fit. In other words, we have to do an initial grading plan for the whole area. Now, whether or not that ever gets built or it takes, <coughs> excuse me, 20 years to get built, you knew that the, the earthwork is going to balance on the whole thing, which is a big time-saving cost. Um, you need to know what the ultimate street pattern is because so you don't end up with streets like, you know, that don't match up and everything else you've got to do it. That's why you need a plan for this whole thing, and that's what we've done for the whole area south of the business center. <clears throat> as I mentioned, the stormwater management's got to work, and it develops as the, as the development progresses. It may take 20 years to develop this whole area, but, but it's always got to be workable at any point in time. It's got to, if you have, <coughs> excuse me, this cough, um, if we have a recession in 10 years, you want to make sure that what you've got built and what's been developed works and it fits. And then maybe in two or three years, you start up the next expansion on the whole thing. So it's, it's looking ahead, but planning the phases so they <coughs> independently work with each other. <coughs> um, we've come up with two plans here. Uh, the first one that's shown here is what we refer to as the preferred concept plan. It incorporates some of the property that the city has control of and it also and runs all the way up to the existing business center. Um, this, if you get time or when you get time to take a look at these boards, either tonight or sometime later this week, that's why I'm leaving them here, you'll see some of the detail that's involved in the whole thing. Like I said, we provided an extreme amount of flexibility for these lots and the lot configurations. We have some things that are somewhat fixed, like there's going to be a new water tower and it's located um, where it's shown on these two plans. So we're working around that. We want a street network that's going to work with the existing street that's in the business center right now. We don't want to have 20 different connections to OK. That doesn't make sense. It's, it turns we're building a lot of streets that you can't do anything on the whole thing. This street network that we've put together to show here will accommodate any of the development, any configuration that's out there. You'll also see, it's a little bit hard to see on this PowerPoint and what Chad gave you, but you'll see some dash lines in there about how we can take some of these larger lots and about through the use of a cul-de-sac, we can break those up internally. Also, again, the flexibility on the whole thing but at the end of the day, the backbone transportation system works. The other plan that's on here, which is the, the alternate concept plan, that's just looking at the rest of the area from the interchange to the north to the business center. Because it's, at some point in time, it's got to fit. Whether it's 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the road or something like that, it's just good planning because we have to design and plan for the infrastructure, the sanitary sewer, the stormwater, the water, all that type of thing has to be, it doesn't care 
where it goes. It's got to work for the whole area. So that's why the planning looks at the whole 400 acres that's out there doing that. <coughs> the last thing I want to mention before I'll open this up for questions, any questions people have, you'll see one map that's on there, which is this thing right, right here. I just put this together. It's interesting to see, and it's really not discernible unless you get out there on the land. I've, I've been on the whole thing. But this is a plot of the existing elevations that are out there. And you may not realize that between I-43 and OK, there's 50 feet of relief. I-43 is up here and OK is down here. It doesn't look like that when you drive by it either on the interstate or when you drive down Business Center Drive, but it's that much. That's really an advantage because when we go to design the grading and the elevations of the final park on this thing, we're able to do some things with that land so it doesn't look like a pool table, which is really unattractive. And we can do some things with the land without moving tens of millions of yards of dirt and make the thing work and make it look really nice. Uh, best example is we did one down in Menominee Falls called the Silver Spring Corporate Park where Coles has their corporate headquarters. And that thing's got four or five tiers on there and it works out great because you don't, walk, you don't drive into this thing and see this mass of buildings and streets and grid work and that. It really works nice and, and makes it very attractive for sales and stuff like that. That, um, the, the last thing I wanna go over to for you is the schedule. Um, again, based upon our experience of doing a number of these things, um, if the city wants to start building in 2018, this is what, based upon our experience, has to happen in the timeline involved. Again, we're looking at starting construction in the spring. This is a, depending upon how many acres we bite off on the first piece, it's still a one construction season project. Um, but we have to get everything ready to do that. We need to take this planning document, these pretty pictures, and turn them into preliminary engineering drawings so that we can tell you, because you're going to ask, I'm sure, how much is this going to cost me when you're all done with this whole thing? A great question. We have to do some engineering to decide, to figure out how much that is. We have some, we have to get sanitary sewer to it. We have to get some water to it. We've got to deal with this grading. We've got to deal with the stormwater. We've got to deal with the streets and the cost of those. And they all fit together. Each one affects the other ones. So we need to get that done. And that is about a three month process. And if we can get started on that, um, we can get done by October. October date is really a critical date from the standpoint of it would allow you enough time to uh, develop a financial plan with staff on this, you know, how you're gonna pay for this thing, how much of this can you bite off on the on first one. And then after you get that done and you decide to go to the next step, then we would work on the final bidding documents for this thing. In other words, finish up the plans, get everything ready, and that's about a four, four and a half month process at, the, at, at least. In order to get this thing, whatever you decide to do initially, ready to bid in February. February is a key date because, as you all know, living in the wonderful state of Wisconsin, we get rid of this white stuff and the ground gets hard. We want to be able to hit the ground running as soon as the weather gets decent in the spring. A couple of things are happening this year and next year as far as some of the, this is going to be a sizable project, not only for the city, but for the, for the bidding contractors that are out there. DOT's projects, as you know, have just about gone down to zero, and we have a lot of dirt contractors and large public works contractors out there that are going to be, they're looking for work. I can guarantee you right now, I got three projects out for bid, and I, it's like, we're getting prices that are really good and they're gonna be a lot better even in the spring. We wanna be able to bid this thing in February, take advantage of that bidding climate so that come mid-March, beginning of April when it dries out, we can hit the ground running, get the utilities in and get the grading done, get everything done, get it buttoned up by between Halloween and Thanksgiving. We have to get this thing finished on the whole thing so that you can take prospective buyers out there and say, look, we're doing it. 
you want to buy some of this? Here's the layout on the whole thing. We're ahead of the game. We have shovel-ready ground for you to start on. You can go out and hire your engineer and your architect and your planner and everything else and go through the approval process with the city, and we can meet, we'll be done before you are on this whole thing. And that is a huge selling point, believe me. Um, but that's really what we're looking at for a construction schedule for 2018. Um, there are some things that dictate this schedule. Like I said, there, the soils out there, it, it's not sand and gravel. In other words, we're limited. We can't be grading out there in February and March and November and December. We, we only have the dry construction season to work with on this whole thing. Um, we have to do a wetland delineation of the entire whatever we can get access to out here, and that wetland delineation has to be done by mid-October at the latest. Otherwise, it doesn't count. You have to have a certain ground temperature and the weather's gotta be the way that it is. That means that we have to get that done in time. And we wanna be able to have, utilize the full construction season of 2018 for the construction of whatever you decide the first phase should be. As I mentioned, uh, you couldn't have picked a better time in the last 10 years to get started on this thing from a pricing standpoint. There's, they're not building a lot of big highway projects next year, and you can really take advantage of that on there. So with that, Mr. Mayor, I'll, I'll try to answer any questions that you or anybody else has. Okay, well, thank you for that presentation. Any questions from the crowd? John? Um, very impressive. Thank you for the, for the work and the overview. Um, one of the things uh, you mentioned is that the cost is unknown, and that we'll get that in time. But um, further to the south, we have to deal with Oosburg, who's giving land away. We've got a significant, you know, it looks like it's going to be a, a capital project that we're going to be looking at. And, you know, when, when they're giving land away, you know, wh what do you think, you know, the, how, you know, how to market this and what the, what's the price point going to be, you know, for... Um, you know, and how do you combat that? Well, I think the, the situation that you're referring to is, from my perspective, is an apple and an orange. Yes, they have land down there, and yes, the price point is probably lower than what you have up through there, but the amenities that you can offer as far as visibility and readiness is, is an advantage of that. There, and I, I don't mean this to be derogatory to any other place. Believe me, I, I, I don't, but they're not the same municipality. They're not the same things. People who, if I'm going to build a building, whether it's an office building, I'm going to build a 100,000 square foot office building. I've got to populate that with people. And the people who are much younger than I are going to work at that thing, and they're going to be attractive to what you guys have done in Sheboygan which is just phenomenal. I went to college with some people from Sheboygan, and so I spent a lot of time up here in my youth on the whole thing. What Sheboygan has done in the last few years up here is just absolutely a phenomenal. If I was 100 years younger, I'd be attracted to an area like this because there's stuff to do and think and say and everything else and, and do something because I think out <clears throat> beyond the eight hours or nine hours I put in during the day. I think what you're going to be selling is you're going to be selling Sheboygan. You're going to be selling the visibility. You're going to be selling the amenities that you have here in town as opposed to another location that's more rural. I mean, that's I'm not a real estate professional. I can't tell you what you can sell this for. I've been involved in projects that land is what the land is and the market takes care of that <coughs> whole thing in there. But they look at prospective developers and prospective buyers look at a package. I've, what's my building gonna cost me? What's the land gonna cost me? What the utility's gonna cost me? How, what are people going to cost me to get here? And how can I keep them here and make them want to come here to work for it? So I think what, and you know this, you have to sell Sheboygan. This is part of the whole thing, but it comes with the, this is, Sheboygan is, is the wrapping on this whole thing. And the visibility of this site, I, I believe quite strongly, is a key selling point to this. Because if I'm gonna build my Taj Mahal, as the chairman of the board of the widget company, I wanna have something that I can bring my family, my stockholders, my competitors to and say, look what I've got here, and you can see it going by, look. 
I mean, let's face it, uh, when you drive down the interstate and you see what Acuity's done out there, uh, that's quite remarkable. Now, you're not going to have, God, I would love to see you get 400 acres of Acuity-like thing. You're not going to have that, but at the same time, you've got opportunities out there that you can't have in a more rural location that you can't even see. It's a long-winded answer to your short question, but to me, you have to sell the package. Is there, go ahead, John, did you have a follow-up? No. Okay, any other questions? Uh, Henry Nelson? Um, I believe that County Trunk OK right now is under reconstruction. Um, has any coordination between the street pattern and what they might be doing on County Trunk OK? Has that taken place at all? I mean, we don't know the extent that we were. It has not, but I don't. I knew that they were working on that this year. I don't see that as a problem. Any place that we're going to have an intersect, one of the things that's on the list, and I've given the city a shopping list. It's as long as both of my arms of things we have to do and in what order. Um, we have to coordinate those intersections with them because it's a county right away. We would, but there's nothing that's going on out there that would prohibit anything from here being done. We're gonna to have to build some intersections, but it's nothing more than okay, most likely, at least for as long as I'm around, will still remain a two-lane road. There's gonna be widenings at the major intersections once we do. We have to coordinate that with the county, and that's one of the things, first things that's on the list that we have to do. We also have to talk to the DOT, because you'll see that we're talking about possibly doing some things with the existing frontage road out there, or not, but that's, county and DOT property, we, that's also a number thing that's way up on the top of the list that we have to do. It's a very good question. You're absolutely right. It, this is more than a city project. It involves a whole lot of regulatory authorities that we have to get all the people on the bus in the right seat heading the bus in the right direction. Thank you. It's like Alder, herding cats. Alder person Lewandowski. You talked before about getting on I-43 as fast as possible. What if the companies don't want to use I-43, but instead would prefer a rail line? How easy would it be to put a rail line in that area? <clears throat> Putting rail lines in, and I, the job I had before I worked at Rick and Milky, I worked for a railroad. That was 40 years ago. But so I understand railroads. Railroads, getting rail access and getting rail lines to anything is very complicated because they look at one thing. How many carloads of stuff are you going to use every day, forever? That's what it is, because before they're, they're willing to, but they showed up with a blank, buck, blank check, they're still not going to do that because they want to make sure that there's going to get enough, it's going to get enough use. Is it possible? Yes, if we got a user in there, in the right, that we'd have to put them in the right location. Then you work with the, the railroad, and it's a, it's a long process, but it's doable. But they're looking at this. It's they, they're not going to put one foot of track out there, because railroads are really, really, really expensive. Unless you can guarantee them a whole lot of, car loadings on a daily basis. I've worked uh, Hartford Industrial Park. Uh, <coughs> On the west side of Hartland, we ran a rail line in there off to Wisconsin and Southern that serves Quad and a couple of other ones. It's doable. You just have to provide enough use for it. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, uh, Mr. Everly, I'll thank you very much for your presentation. Chad, did you have anything you wanted to wrap up? Okay, then we'll return to the agenda. Thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you. Next item is public forum, city clerk. Uh, yes, we have four this evening. Uh, first on the list is Terrence Doyle. Terrence, if you could come on up. And Terrence, can I have your home address, please? Uh, 1135 Broadway. Okay, and you will have five minutes, sir. Thank you. Well, I'm back again. Thanks for the uh, two words today, information and uh, communication. I've been sharing as much information as I can about this uh, water lateral project going on from 7th Street to 13th Street. I shared the information about uh, 
how I feel it's uh, how fair or unfair it is on the uh, cost of uh, the police powers of assessment uh, by ordinance. I share the fact that, uh, that the ordinance does not really apply to the assessment. Um, share the information on the, with, I share with the Common Council a couple of different times here, you know, first before the vote, afterwards with a letter to the Common Council. I have shared this information again with the uh, Board of Water Commissioners uh, just this last week, and they've uh, sent back the letter with uh, accept and file. That's why I'm here. Uh, before you accept and file, I thought I'd throw it out here one more time because I just don't want to go away. <laughs> so the uh, fact we had a good meeting with the uh, uh, water commissioners, and we discussed the price point and how they come up with it. They come up with a price based on quoting by the contractors. And the easiest way to keep tack, tab of the contractors is have them quote by foot. Uh, granted, there is footage for uh, supposedly a property owners from the long side of the ro uh, road to the short side. <coughs> Difference in length or cost. Uh, we understand that. That's how it, uh, the layout is. We also discussed that they, they could take the numbers, this is off their sheet, and have it uh, total, totaled and then divided amongst how many services are put there. So each house has one pipe coming in, and that's what you pay for. You, how the whole project is budgeted and cost is uh, something they can develop in the, in the process in the middle of it. Then they can take that number and then distribute it out equally to everybody. They discussed that. We discussed it. They said yes, they could do that, but then it'd be conflicting, saying, "Well, we have an issue of, uh, you know, someone on the short side say, well, it's really not the same because they're they're paying a little more than because they only have a shorter run." No, I, just, I guess uh, I understand that uh, they were nice enough to get the contractors to push the numbers a little bit, 20 percent one way more from the short side of the street, which is a, uh, the short side of the street pays $112 a foot. The long side of the street pays $93 a foot. I don't necessarily agree with the push to kind of to try and balance things out because in my, uh, that's still not a uh, fair game. I just plain fair. Yeah, it's, it's trying to balance the number, which I appreciate that much by the, uh, what they try to do there. But this, uh, I don't think it's quite right. They try, try to come up with some other ideas of uh, uh, giving credits, credits and stuff like, <coughs> excuse me, credits, but uh, <coughs> that, that doesn't go over well because then someone has to pay for that and credits are paid for a city and I'm sure you guys can approve that, so, which is I wouldn't either, so. Uh, the point I'm trying to get to is uh, the communication. I can share as much information I can here. I can try to get you to buy into it. Uh, I know the uh, Common Council or the, the <coughs> Board of Water Commissioners um, said accept and file it. Uh, I, I didn't know the last time we were here they were going to send to a committee. I didn't know that was a committee. I look at that as, well. Oh, you put the fox in the hen house. You know, the fox is one that's coming back and saying share and file because they ate all the hens already. So uh, it's just a bad pun. But uh, the. Uh, <coughs> The next point of this, and if, it, if you share, if you accept and file, is that this has been a pretty good, uh, uh, lengthy, drawn-out process for me, and I, and I don't mind. It's been, it's been good. I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot about the laws, and I've learned how to find the laws, and how to read them, and interpret them. Um, everybody has a little different viewpoint on that. Um, again, you don't have to build by footage. You can decide, the Common Council can decide exactly how they want this to be assessed. Uh, there's the, the uh, how are that pro how are the process works. The, pro the process that goes from here, if it's accepted and or accepted and filed, is that the next step in my process here, because uh, is to then file a judicial appeal, and that's all part of the format. I have learned a lot about common counsel and how things go through here and what to do, and it's been very interesting. And uh, I really do appreciate your time, uh, consideration on this. Uh, I don't know what you else, uh, how much more information I can share. Uh, I just can't seem to get the, I uh, shared the information, the communication's not working so well because I'm not getting through apparently, but I'm trying. Uh, that's all I can do. I would really ask to answer any questions if anybody have a question about this, uh, that might be able to answer, but more care to. And your time is up, Terrence. Pardon? Time is up. Thank you very much. You just hit it yeah. right on the head. Have a happy fourth. <clears throat>
All right, next on the list is Debbie Damelon. Debbie? Debbie, can I have your home address, please? Okay, it's 1704 North 35th Street, Sheboygan. Okay, okay. you'll have five minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, in regards to the Friends of the Black River Forest letter addressed to the Common Council about your responsibility to your constituents, we don't want this rush through hostile annexation that benefits one man to the detriment of the residents of the town of Wilson, the taxpayers of the city of Sheboygan, and Lake Michigan, the potable water for the whole Midwest, not to mention the negative environmental repercussions to air quality that come with the destruction of a full-fledged forest, sand dunes, and wildlife habitat. We are asking you to refuse the annexation and rezoning of the Black River Forest. We, your constituents, pay you to represent us. I demand that you show me the numbers, um, I want to see your logs of phone calls and emails made by city residents for and against Kohler's request, not made up numbers, and I don't want to hear that you have just decided to vote for this. This decision is too serious for that. A golf course does not grow a residential base unless you're thinking of refusing Kohler's conditional use permit and rezoning to the SR5 in order to encourage Kohler, Kohler to build subdivisions. However, that would be dishonest and devious. Finally, this could be an endless pit of cost to city taxpayers. For the first five years, the city has to give the town of Wilson's share of the annexed properties taxes to the town of Wilson. There will be infrastructure costs, water, sewer, fire, Chemical runoff will pollute land and water, including Lake Michigan, which we will have to pay to clean. Wisconsin already rates among the 12 worst states for potable water. And when he doesn't make the wished for profits from his golf course, Kohler will sue the city of Sheboygan as he did the town of Mosul and the village of Kohler for taxes that he refuses to pay. Extending the water line for the golf course property should be completely at Kohler's cost. There is even talk that the only city water that Kohler would use would be for his clubhouse, not to water his green. Why would we extend water all the way to the town of Wilson and around at a cost of upwards of $10 million for city taxpayers when Kohler may not even use city water? <coughs> Promises are not deals. If the town of Wilson sues the city on the grounds of hostile annexation, which overwhelmingly leads to litigation, currently the cost of what Kohler will pay is a measly $200,000 of litigation fees. Knowing how costly litigation can be, it was suggested that Kohler pay all litigation costs, which makes sense since this project is his wish, Kohler's wish, and he will be the one profiting from it. Someone feared that we might lose a contract if we raise Kohler's litigation contribution. Shouldn't that be a red flag that we could get stuck in a legal quagmire that could completely drain us financially? If Kohler pulls out, that should be the signal that this is a real bad deal. Then there are the litigation costs of landowners whose wells will either run dry or worse, be poisoned from long chemicals. Who will be stuck paying those fees? Not Kohler. As a city resident, I want to stay on good terms with the town of Wilson. I don't want the uh, city of Sheboygan to expand by diminishing the town of Wilson, which means that I want to respect the town of Wilson's boundaries and their master plan and vision for their town. I do not want to condone or support Kohler's attempt to avoid regulation and to fast tra track this shady deal so that we don't get wind of all of the hidden costs. I don't want our representatives to get wooed into the false promises of Kohler's sophisticated marketing team and vote for something without taking the time to check out all of the claims through unbiased third parties. I also do not want to be an unwary victim of Kohler tactics. Kohler is like a cat. Regardless of anyone else, which includes city or town residents, Kohler will always land on his feet financially. As the letter of the Friends of the Black River Forest states, the town of Wilson residents will suffer of all of the immediate negative impacts. However, we, the ta city taxpayers, will be affected by the unknowns yet to be determined. This is too big of an endeavor to gamble on. As that psychologist at the public hearing said, if this deal seems too good to be true, <coughs> then it is. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the list is Mary Fadish. Mary, if you could come up, please. Move this to 
see the timer? Sure. <coughs> can you move it okay? Help me. Henry, can you help her? And Mary, can I have your home address, please? My home address is 5631 Driftwood Lane. All right, and you will have five minutes. Thank you. Uh, you have a letter. You received a letter from Friends of the Black River Forest, Claudia Bricks, uh, a co-spokesperson, and myself, started investigating the Kohler Company to find out what kind of developer was going to come into our town. We had never, I'm from Wilson, we had never heard any information on what Kohler planned for the Tented Forest. There was no transparency in our town board. So we decided we would say, well, uh, let's look at who the developer is. Uh, as also the industrial psychologist pointed out to you, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. So you have that letter. Uh, of lawsuits and reneging and not following the rules. And I'm not going to uh, totally go into it, but everything that comes, uh, everything that I say comes out of that letter and is a question to you of please, please, it's almost begging, pay more attention to who you are getting involved with. Uh, there has been an incredible rush to get this through and many, many city residents know nothing about the annexation plan. In fact, the gentleman from Rukert Milky gave a complete presentation, which would have been nice uh, to have been given on the subject of annexation to the city of Sheboygan residents. They knew nothing. And we hear that there was enough time for people to speak on annexation at the plan commission meeting. That was so rushed and the entire issue of annexation had not been presented to the public when that plan commission meeting took place. We'd like you to explain to city residents why you're taking one developer's word for it. Did you, did you accept the developer's environmental impact report vetted by anybody but the developer? telling you everything was just going to be great, there'd be no serious environmental impacts? Do you realize that in the PREA annexation agreement, there's no obligation for Kohler to build anything? What's your plan B? The public isn't aware um, of all the things that are missing in the PREA annexation agreement, all the questions that need to be asked. And I just want to say that on July 9th, there is a group of city residents that we are very happy who came for, who are coming forward and are having an open meeting for other city of Sheboygan residents to talk to them about the questions that your plan commission and your city government have not asked in terms of costs, uh, in, economic impacts, and environmental impacts. And they will be inviting you to come. And they'll have experts there who will be reviewing Kohler's economic impact report. Why hasn't your staff given you this information? Why do city of Sheboygan residents have to meet outside of here to talk about all the things that have not been included in this annexation and zoning plan? Important details on zoning and annexation have not been provided. Just one little question. How will the installation of services affect current service users and taxpayers? No one said anything about that. Ladies and gentlemen, you have had no meaningful interaction with your constituents on this very serious issue of a contentious annexation for it will end up the profit of one company. We believe there should be a new public hearing on annexation and zoning so that the public can have some information from which they can ask questions. You know, to say, oh, people could have asked questions at the plan commission meeting. They didn't know anything. They didn't know what to ask. And I know there are people sitting there saying, well, we don't care about, you know, what Kohler's reputation is in terms of a developer. 
but boy, are we going to get out of a financial hole. We have so many things that Kohler is going to give this city. I really want you to think about, about that and whether your constituents want you to sell the city of Sheboygan to the company of Kohler. And I think that when you become aware of unethical behavior and the condition of the lake and all of the serious problems in the state, it makes, it puts you on a level of being ethically um, accountable. And I hope that you will be. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. And last on the list will be Alize Desmoulins. And Alize, can I have your home address, please? Yes, I live at 1704 North 35th Street in okay, the city have, of Sheboygan. Okay, and you'll have five minutes. Thank you. So I am going to address item 4.4 .4 on the agenda in regards to a correspondence you received from Jane Dabrowski about the pictures, uh, the pictures of the access road that Kohler Company plans on putting in through state lands to access his proposed golf course property. This would be like the description that would fit along with those pictures. And it is part of the Kohler Park Dunes State Natural Area. And the reason for the preservation is that the site contains excuse me, excellent examples of lake dunes and beach communities. Two state-threatened plants are present. The description of this Kohler Park dunes is that it contains active and stabilized dunes, one-fourth mile of beach, and a small dry mesic white pine forest. There are several interdunal ponds, thickly vegetated with lakeshore rush. Some of the common plants that stabilize the dunes are sand reed, Canada wild rye, marum grass, northern wheatgrass, common and trailing junipers, sand cherry and willow species. In autumn, the skies above the dunes are often frequented by migrating raptors, while the low shrubs and ponds are very attractive to songbirds. This text comes directly out of the Kohler Andre State Park Master Plan that you can find on the DNR website. And more of their goals in this plan is that primary management emphasis is on preserving the outstanding outstanding scenic qualities and natural features of the parks. The areas of most intensive concern are the dunes areas and the beachfront. These are the features that over the years have continually attracted visitors to Kohler Andre State Parks. Almost any bird species that migrates through Wisconsin can be observed at some time of the year on the properties. Correspondence that the DNR received when they put this uh, park, this master plan together in 1989, said, or part of it quoted, contrary to the National Park Service plan, the department's master plan recommends that J.M. Kohler Park, so that's the northern half of the Kohler Terry Andre Parks, be kept in a more natural state with limited recreational development. To further protect the rare plant species and communities in Kohler's remnant dunes, the master plan will propose expansion of the M. Kohler Park Dunes natural area as discussed with the Bureau of Endangered Resources. So not only should we not be putting an access road through that portion of which you have the pictures, and contrary to what Kohler company was claiming, there is no road currently through that parcel of land, the master plan of the Kohler Kohler Terry Andre Parks wants to expand that portion of the dunes because of its biotic significance. Kohler Andre State Parks owe their existence to the early acquisition of large blocks of, blocks of land by Frank T. Andre and the Kohler family and their interest in early conservation efforts. So even the original idea of the land, even by the Kohler family, was for conservation. An area consisting of unspoiled beach, a narrow, unstabilized dune area, unstabilized dunes covered with northern hardwoods was designated in 1967 as the M. Kohler Park Pines Natural Area. This is the land that is part of the proposed golf course area. This 95-acre natural area located on private lands in the northeast section of the parks lost its official, its official designation when the Department of Natural Resources lease on Kohler lands expired. As you can see, all these designations by the park 
kind of let you know how important this ecosystem is for the integrity of the Kohler Andre State Parks. Because the minute you fragment the ecosystem, then a lot of these wild, a lot of the wildlife loses some of its habitat. And at the time, there are 242 acres of private inholdings that's included, including the Kohler land and others, within the existing park boundary that impede development of a meaningful trail system and complicate administration of the park. And in closing, if the private Kohler lands are acquired, an additional three miles of combination horse hike, hiking cross-country ski trail would be developed. So the whole plan of the DNR at that time was to add the Kohler parcel to their land. They were trying to achieve that through state acquisition. So when you're looking at this, it's not just you know, a road into his golf course. If anything, he should be accessing his golf course through property he owns to the north, not through state land. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for this evening. Thank you very much. Next, we'll go on to mayor's announcements. First of all, I want to wish everyone a happy 4th of July for in advance of tomorrow. I'd like to remind the older persons that the parade lineup will start at 8 o'clock and will be right in front of City Hall. And uh, there's been some uh, discussion in the community about uh, not sure where the parade route's going to be. So the parade is going to start at 9 a.m. It'll go up A Street to Michigan Avenue. It'll go east on Michigan to Broughton Drive and then south to the YMCA. And if anybody is uh, interested in learning more about the other events, they can visit, visit Sheboygan.com. The website has the complete schedule for the 4th of July. Next, we'll move on to a hearing. Item 2.1 is hearing number 5 of 1718, pursuant to notice published and personal notices sent by the city clerk. A hearing is scheduled for this evening for the proposed assessments for water lateral replacement in Michigan Avenue from North 3rd Street to North 4th Street. Is there anyone wishing to be heard? Is there anyone wishing to be heard? Is there anyone wishing to be heard? Other person, Wolf? Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to close. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The hearing will be closed. Next, we'll move on to the consent agenda. <clears throat> That'll include items 3.2 through 3.6. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to accept and file all our O's, accept and adopt all our C's, and pass <coughs> all resolutions and ordinances. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. The uh, consent agenda is before us. Is there a discussion on any of those items? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll for passage? Eyes. Motion passes. Moving on to uh, reports of officers. Item 4.1 is RO number 71 of 1718 <coughs> by the Director of Planning and Development submitting a request from Chad Palachek for the Discovery World Museum to dock the Dennis Sullivan at South Pier on August 15th of 2017 and waiving any docking fees. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to suspend and approve the request. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? <coughs> 14 eyes. Motion passes. Item 4.2 is RO number 72 of 1718 by the Director of Human Resources and Labor Relations and the Fire Chief submitting the Sheboygan Fire Department Administrative Study, a report of findings and recommendations. The City Sheboygan Fire Department Administrative Study, July 2017, Sections 1 and 2. Um, Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to accept and file. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? <clears throat> 
14 ayes. Motion passes. Next is item 4.3, which is RO number 73 of 1718 by the city clerk submitting a communication from Nina Staple regarding the annexation and the SR5 zoning of her property into the city of Sheboygan. Alder Person Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to accept and file. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Um, Alder Person Nelson. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, if possible, I would like the, uh, does the city clerk have a copy of that letter uh, in her possession there? Because uh, what I would like to do if she doesn't is I would like to read that letter. I find it kind of interesting because it's, it's from a town of Wilson uh, a resident that has a different perspective on the proposed annexation. I can read it. Would the city clerk you. please read that then? <laughs> Thank you. Saves, saves me squinting at this little screen here. <laughs> okay, um, this is addressed to Mayor Vandersteen and the council members. Um, I own and live at 1202 Stall Road in the town of Wilson. I have run businesses for 37 years and I moved to 1202 Stall at a Road as my dream location. I signed the petition circulated by a Kohler company to annex my property both as an owner and as an elector. I want to clear up the confusion and misstatements made at the June 19th council meeting. I support both the annexation and the SR5 zoning of my property. To me, this is just common sense. Our town chairman said I was going to sell my home to Kohler company at the meeting. This is not the truth as I love my home and made no such statement to Mr. John Amon. I have been frustrated with the current leadership of the town of Wilson in this entire issue, blocking so much needed income for our township. We recently voted to pay extra to keep our <coughs> dump open while at the same time losing such a huge tax base by fighting the golf course. While I understand that the city of Sheboygan's tax rate is higher than the town of Wilson's, I expect more for my tax dollars in Sheboygan. And I think regional growth is essential to avoid the likely alternative of stagnation. Town leaders do not speak for me when they stridently object to the proposed annexation, rezoning, and Kohler's planned golf course. I support all three because I've seen firsthand how property values will increase. I owned land in the town of Mosul when Whistling Straits was built, and my land value has more than tripled. This is a matter of property rights. Landowners should be able to make reasonable use of their land. The SR5 zoning for my property is essential to ensure that my use is permitted. Opponents may want to, excuse me, opponents want to prevent any use of land along Lake Michigan. Taking private land without paying for it is not right. Kohler has been very generous with his property to all Wilson residents for years and now he wants to put his land to use that will only help the economy of Sheboygan. When I first heard that I was being annexed to Sheboygan like everyone else, I was shocked. But after very quickly doing my due diligence of many calls and visits to different departments in Wilson as well as Sheboygan, I made the decision that I am very much in favor of the annexation. I hope you will join me in supporting the annexation petition and SR5 zoning request not just for the Kohler company, but for homeowners like myself. With residents being annexed into the city, I personally do not believe it would be fair to do any other zoning. I understand that Kohler does have to apply for conditional use permits to get proper zoning for the golf course. Thank you for your consideration in this matter. Sincerely, Nina Stapp Staple, maybe? I guess. That's it. Thank you very much. Is there any other discussion on the motion? Seeing none, will the clerk, well, I'll, we'll do just do a voice vote. All those in favor of the accept and file, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Item 4.4 .4 is RO number 76 of 1718 by the city clerk submitting a communication from Jane Zabrowski regarding photos of Kohler's proposed development sites on state park property taken by Jim Buchholz, the past superintendent of Kohler Andre State Park. Alder Person Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to accept and file. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. 
Item 4.5 is RO number 74 of 1718 by the city clerk submitting a communication from the Friends of Black River Forest sharing what they have learned and experienced over the years following the Kohler Company's actions and private uh, relation representations of their projects. Alder President Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I make a motion to accept and file. Doesn't even have a motion. Accept and file. Accept and file. Thank you. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Item 4.6 is RO number 75 of 1718 by the City Planning Commission to whom is referred for resolution number 36 of 1718. Uh, Alder Person Bitters and Donahue approving the Capital Improvements Program and recommend by the Capital Improvements Commission for the program period of 2018 to 2022 and adopting the program for implementation. Uh, Alder Person Bellinger. Thank you. I move to accept, adopt, and pass resolution. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the motion? I'm sorry, who seconded the motion? <clears throat> Thank you. Seeing no discussion, will the clerk please call the roll for pass? Alderperson Bellinger? Um, I've, I've got some you know, grave concerns uh, regarding uh, the amount that is on here. It's almost uh, $12 million, 11.8, 11.9. Um, you know, when you figure in City Hall as well as uh, the, you know, the 5.3 million for the, for the capital. Uh, in the past years, we've been used to borrowing $3 million a year. Last year, we approved um, 9 million, which was a 200% <coughs> increase. Um, you know, now this year, we're looking at almost 12 million, which is, you know, 137% increase. Um, we've got last week, or last meeting, um, I asked uh, the question, how much money do we have in our reserves? And I was told it was 10 million. Well, that's not the real number. The real number is 20 million or 18 million, somewhere in, in that range. And um, what, what I would like to do is I would like to hold this document until Carol Worth could be present and she could address some of the um, ramifications of borrowing this kind of money and um, and um, also how we fund the uh, city hall and if it would be better to use some uh, of our reserves to do that. Uh, I, I think that in, in light of everything that's going on around us, if you look at the, the state of Illinois, the city of Chicago, um, you know, what's going on with the state of California when they get themselves into financial trouble by borrowing too much. Um, I don't think this is a road that we want to be going down. And I think that uh, having her expertise and her opinion and to be able to address some uh, questions from the alderman would uh, be very insightful. Okay, we have a motion to hold on the floor. Is there a second? Okay, we have a, a, a motion then. Um, this is debatable, right? Motion to hold is debatable. Okay, so the discussion would be on uh, the motion to hold. Alder Person Nelson. Uh, no. Uh, anyone else? Alder Person Donahue. Um, I'll speak against the motion. Um, this has been uh, debated extensively. Carol Worth has been present uh, both at the Plan Commission as well, or the um, uh, Capital Improvements Commission as well as in front of this body to suggest in any way, shape, or form that our city is in financial trouble, that we are near bankruptcy, that we are borrowing beyond our limits, that we are being foolish. I've heard the word used reckless <coughs> a number of times. It's just simply not true. When we put, when we start talking percentages and we add City Hall into that percentage, of course the number does look quite large. City Hall is a one-off matter that we need to deal with and I think that using our reserves strategically to cover part of that cost, <coughs> once we finally decide what it is we're going to do with City Hall, certainly makes sense. That's why you have reserves, at least to some extent. Here's the problem when you only borrow $3 million a year. I liken it, as I have a number of times, to not maintaining the house that you live in. You decide that you're going to put off the maintenance of the roof because you don't want to borrow anything. 
You're going to put off repairing the windows. You're going to put off painting. When you finally are forced to do these things, the cost is much greater. The extent of the work that needs to be done is much more extensive. And you haven't done a good job of maintaining your house, or in this case, we haven't done a good job of maintaining our city. If there's one thing that we heard in the last election, the condition of roads in this city is abysmal, and we need to address it. Now, I sit on the Capital Improvements Commission. We went through. Trust me, you look at that document line by line by line. Each department head came in and made full justification for all of the requests that they were making. These are basic maintenance issues that we need to address. And to put this off any longer and to have Carol Worth come in one more time and say, you guys are in pretty good condition. You know, you borrowed at 28% of your statutory rate and then vote makes no sense to me. I think we need to get this taken care of tonight. It has been thoroughly vetted. The $5.3 million that is the real capital improvements part of this is a reasonable and necessary part of everything that we're looking to do. We just need to take care of these things and we can't put them off any longer. Um, we could continue to just borrow $3 million a year. The roads can continue to get worse. We cannot replace equipment. We cannot borrow at reasonable rates as we are doing now. We can wait four or five or six years as the holes in the road get deeper and deeper and the equipment becomes less and less usable. But why are we doing that? That, I would suggest to you, is the reckless way of approaching city business. Let's just get this taken care of tonight. Please vote against the hold motion and let's approve this budget. Thank you for those comments. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I agree with Mary Lynn wholeheartedly. I, th I am I'm amazed that we're again discussing this situation about borrowing money. We've had, um, we've had her come in several times. We have talked about borrowing. We have tried to educate the, the group to understand that $3 million is a very, very small amount of money. Um, I believe it was even last year when I questioned the $3 million. We, we wouldn't have even been able to uh, establish the mandatory items because it came in at 3.1 million. We've heard it from our constituents over and over and over, fix the roads, take care of things that are falling apart, and we need to do that. And I, I understand we have a five-year plan, but it's a plan, it's, a goal, it's an opportunity for us. We can change it as we go. The things that the Capital Improvements Group has been looking at are things that are needed and like Mary Lynn had said, uh, you know, if we don't take care of the city, which we haven't been doing for many, many years, the problems that we're trying to fix today are not the problems that we have created as a council. They are problems that have gone on and on and on. As some people would say, the can has been kicked down the road. The problem that we have today is we can't kick the can down the road because the holes are too big. It doesn't roll anywhere. We need to continue to move things forward. We have to do it in a responsible manner. We have plenty of people that are very knowledgeable. We have our city administrator. We have, um, I can't think of her name again, uh, Kathy, or the one that John wants to bring in. Um, that would be Carol Worth. Carol, thank you. I'm sorry about that. We've had Carol come in on many occasions, whether it's just for finance or for council. Um, I, I don't understand why we have to keep beating this horse to glue when we, we've already established the fact that we have borrowed more than we have in the past couple of years. We've been putting it to things, projects that need to be done. Um, I think we're doing a good job vetting things and making sure that we're being responsible on that. I, un I, take, I understand the fact that we don't want to just continue to spend money frivolously, but the rates are very good right now and we are trying to get caught up in the, in the cuts that have been made year over year, decade over decade. So please vote no on this item. Thank you. Alderperson Boren. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I don't really have much difficulty with the uh, borrowing the 5.3. However, I wasn't able to attend the, the meetings uh, when this was discussed. Uh, can somebody explain to me the rationale for borrowing 6.5 million for City Hall when we, I'm going by what Alderman Bellinger says, we have 18 to $20 million in reserve. 
And then also, how much do we anticipate that that uh, reserve will grow in, uh, in 2018 and 19, for example, that would allow us to maybe uh, take more out of the reserves rather than budgeting as much for the, uh, or borrowing the 6.5? Uh, Administrator Hofflin, can you answer that question for all the person born? Question before you is uh, the two two elements. One is the total estimated cost for rehabilitation of, or renovation of this building. The second is uh, how to fund that. Uh, as it was stated earlier, the city has approximately twenty million dollars of overall fund balance, of which roughly half of it is in excess of our uh, stated policy of having roughly twenty five percent of our fund balance in the general fund for reserves. So anything over that 25% would be available for the city council to consider for spending for projects uh, of, of the nature of large capital like, like a city hall. So in essence, the 10 million is the amount over and above the 25%. Uh, so not all 20 million would be available if you were to follow our existing policy regarding reserves in the general fund. Uh, the capital improvement program that was presented, uh, being conservative uh, in recognition that the Bray Architect study has not been uh, completed. Uh, they are in doing their due diligence at this point. In order to be conservative, I guess on the high side, uh, 10.5 million was used. Again, this is simply uh, a planning document. Uh, of that 10.5, uh, again, the, uh, a number was, was incorporated into the document of $4 million of use of that fund balance in the general fund with roughly, with in essence, 6.5 to be used uh, as a revenue source being general obligations debt. Um, it's going to be up to the city council to ultimately to finalize the, the specifications for that city hall project. So whether it comes in at 10.5, it comes in at 8.5. I think the original range was roughly 8.3, 8.4, all the way up to over 12 million. So the 10.5, in essence, was staff's attempt to come in at, at middle ground. So the council will have an opportunity to fine tune the specifications. Ultimately, when the uh, bid opening, uh, the council again will have an opportunity through um, addendums to add or subtract uh, based upon the bids this is a planning document. Uh, once those bids are open, then the council can finalize, again, what they feel comfortable as far as using fund balance uh, versus what they consider uh, what they're comfortable as far as issuing general obligation, bond, general obligation bonds. Uh, as Alder Wolf identified, um, the city had great success this last spring with the issuance of our 2017 general obligation bond. We had very favorable uh, interest rates. Uh, the forecast is, and it, uh, it appears that, again, we will have low, overall low interest rates, which, again, is favorable for the city should they consider uh, a borrowing amount that is uh, no, uh, higher than uh, past roughly $3 million, uh, with the exception of uh, last year. You want to follow up, please? Yeah, if I could follow up. Uh, <clears throat> Daryl, uh, when, when do you anticipate that the council is going to get some information on the cost of the renovation and, you know, that we have some options? Uh, my, my understanding, and again, uh, Director of Public Works uh, David Beeble is in the audience, uh, it's going to be roughly another uh, month and a half. So would it be, would it be better, uh, what's, what's the timeline on borrowing the 6.5 because if we're going to have information in a month or a month and a half and it turns out that we decide to go with a $9 million version rather than 10.5 or whatever the case may be, wouldn't that influence about how much we actually want to borrow for City Hall? Right. Uh, again, the purpose for capital improvement planning is to be able to create a planning document. Uh, the council at any point, uh, based upon uh, additional information, can make revisions. So again, this is a planning document. Uh, my hope is that uh, as the city staff begins to uh, work in earnest on the 2018 budget, uh, prior to the 
to the point where uh, an executive version of that budget is presented to you, uh, by that time we may have additional information. So my recommendation as part of that executive budget may be a lower amount associated with the 2018 borrowing for this project. So as additional information is available, uh, we will update our documents uh, and the next opportunity after this uh, action is taken tonight uh, would be the 2018 proposed budget. And again, my expectation is we'll, we will have additional information and so that number will be fine-tuned. So in other words, we're not gonna borrow, we're not gonna uh, have Carol Worth come up here and give us a, a you know, a, a, a projected borrowing agreement at, 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 at our next couple of meetings. This is gonna be a little bit down the road. So this, this 6.5 is still subject to change, is what you're saying? Yes, uh, we anticipate similar to 2017, our 2018 borrowing schedule will probably result in a borrowing uh, in April. So we have a lot of time between now and then. And I don't want to get too much into the weeds of uh, remodeling City Hall, but is there a study going on of, of in this entire building as far as desks and, and computers and everything, everything else? Is there a study going, under, uh, going on of what we're going to be able to maintain and not buy new? Because that, to me, would be a huge savings. I mean, if we have to buy a uh, new desk for every department when the other ones are personally... <coughs> Functional, you know, they may be old, but they're functional. Uh, there may be a tremendous savings in that that's going to knock down that, you know, that uh, if, if the $10 million is just brick and mortar, uh, or does that include, you know, replacing all of the fixtures in City Hall? I hope we're looking at ways to reuse some of the things that are already here. Uh, my understanding at the present time, Bray Architects is working. Uh, on developing an analysis more of the bricks and mortar, uh, as well as uh, uh, HVAC system. Uh, as you know, uh, the concept that I think was supported by the council uh, did include looking at uh, reorienting the building to the north as opposed to right now to Center Street. So it involved looking at, uh, their study involves uh, an analysis of a small you know, addition onto the north side, which would be the primary access point. Uh, I, I'm not aware that they are looking specifically at this time on, on personal property, which would be desk, chairs. Do you think that would be a good idea that somebody does that study? Uh, that's my understanding that study will be done, uh, but at the present time they're working on what they think is sort of the meteor, meteor portion of, of their scope of services. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Alderperson Holshue. Thank you. Um, I just, have, just need one point and then to clarify and then uh, one question. I know that um, Alderman Donahue and Wolf have been saying that we spent 3.3, but didn't we approve 5.3? Already? Sorry? We approved the, the borrowing of 5.3, not 3.3. And they were referring that we spend 3.3 each year. Spend. Well, we've spent $3 million a year on capital improvements up until last year where we went up to $5 million. This is a little bit over it at 5.3. Okay, so Plus we City did Hall. go up one year. Yes. And my, I'm wondering, is it possible to know what the interest rate is above at this time? I mean, in a, a ballpark, what it might be? Because it makes sense to borrow more money at a lower interest rate. Of course. Uh, in, in the audience is uh, Director of Finance, uh, Nancy Buss. Is it 2%? 2.07. That kind of makes sense to do it at that time. Uh, Thank ten, you. Ten years repayment schedule. Thank you. Alder Person Boren. I had one more question that I forgot to ask, and that is on the, uh, on the 18 to $20 million that we have in reserve. Uh, what is our return on that money? We have, I presume we have, some of, we have some or all of it invested. You know, we may be borrowing at 2% or whatever it turns out to be. Well, what's our re rate of return on that money? Pardon me? Thank you. I, I guess for those that may be listening uh, via cable or on demand, it, she said 1.37? 3.9. 3.9. Uh, the city of Sheboygan is restricted as to the type of investment options um, and as a result uh, there are some limitations and that ultimately affects our, our interest income. 
I, I understand. Okay, is there any more discussion on the uh, motion to uh, table? Seeing none, will it? Ms. Clearing my throat. Call the roll to table. Or to hold. Okay. My vote would be to hold, nay vote would be not to hold. <clears throat> Jim, I don't have yours. I said nay. Pardon me? No, I don't have Jim's. Uh, oh, here it is. I was on the wrong screen. Okay. okay. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. <coughs> Two eyes, 12 noes. Motion's defeated. Okay, we're uh, back to uh, addressing the main motion to accept and adopt and pass the resolution. Is there any further discussion on the capital improvements program? Alder Person Sorensen. Um, okay, I was just reading it before, but could someone explain more? Um, uh, I think it's on, okay, there's no page numbers. Um, I'm more curious about this, this downtown uh, parking garage and, and what the plan is for that. I, I know that there's been discussion at, uh, at previous council meetings in the past before I was on, but um, from my work dealing with parking garages in the past, I know those are can be very costly projects and the return on the investments can be close to zero. So just, I don't know what the thinking was behind that. Go ahead. Uh, currently the city uh, hasn't, a consultant uh, engaged in a study. Uh, they've done interviews of staff as well as uh, downtown business owners as well as uh, employers, uh, larger employers in the downtown area. My recollection is um, uh, now that we're into July sometime this month, uh, a draft report will be made available. The intended uh, revenue source for this is TIF district related funds, uh, so not uh, general obligations, uh, also some user fees, uh, no use of fund balance, so primarily uh, downtown TIF related funding will support this project should, should it get a green light. Thank you. Any other discussion? Seeing none, the Kirk, please call the roll for passage. Thirteen eyes, one no. Motion passes. Items 4.7 through 4.13 will be referred to various committees. Under resolutions, 5.1 is resolution number 42 of 1718 by Alderperson Wolf, authorizing accepting a grant from the Sheboygan, uh, from Sheboygan County in the amount of $6,925 to be used towards the 88 kayak canoe launch facility at Kiwanis Park. Uh, let's see, that'll lie over. And uh, 5.2 will be referred to the Public Works Committee. Under reports of committees, item 6.1 is RC number 65 of 1718 by finance and personnel to whom was referred direct referral resolution number 39 of 1718 by Alderperson Donahue and Boren approving the fiscal year 2017 one year annual action plan for the community development Black Grant Program uh, submission recommends passing the resolution. Um, Alderperson Donahue. Thank you, Mayor. I move to accept, adopt, and pass the resolution. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Fourteen eyes. Motion passes. 
Item 6.2 is RC number 66 of 1718 by the Finance and Personnel Committee. To whom is referred direct referral resolution number 40 of 1718 by Alderperson Donahue and Boren, authorizing and accepting a grant from the Fund for Lake Michigan in the amount of $30,000 to be used for the Adopt a Beach and, and Adopt a Coastal Habitat Education Program and recommends passing the resolution. Alderperson Donahue. Thank you, Mayor. I move to accept, adopt, and pass the resolution. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? <clears throat> 14 ayes. Motion passes. Item 6.3 is RC number 61 of 1718 by the Finance and Personnel Committee. To whom is referred RO number 62 of 1718 by the city clerk submitting a request for Mayor Vandersteen on behalf of the city to use one of the city's free Blue Harbor Conference Center days to host a meeting of the Urban Alliance League of Municipalities on July 28th of 2017 and recommends approving the request. Alderperson Donahue. Thank you, Mayor. I move to accept and approve the request. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Under matters laid over, item 7.1 is resolution number 35 of 1718 by Alderperson Donahue and Boren authorizing establishing an appropriation in the 2017 budget for purchase of land and building. Alderperson Donahue. Thank you. I move to pass the resolution. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the motion? Alderperson Boren. Just for the people at home that might be watching, this is uh, for the city to purchase the old uh, Social Security building uh, right across the street from City Hall. Thank you for that information. Is there any other discussion? the person Sorensen so I, I know kind of our, our thinking behind this was that you know we're purchasing this building as to help transition with uh, with the new City Hall renovation is there any plans after you know once the City Hall is done what we oh we, yeah, we did discuss that what we're gonna use for after once the City Hall is complete Chad Palachek would you like to answer that question has that, I guess like my, my question is has there been any additional planning or anything with that as well at this stage, we have not um, thought about what it would be. There's some, I believe there's opportunity that will present itself as we move forward. Um, whether this is a continued use as a city facility of some sort or um, repurposed it into a downtown office building or a part lease, part sell, I guess we just haven't thought about it. It's just that it makes, it makes sense right now for us to try to lock it up to get at least the three departments finance building inspection uh, and clerk's office potentially in there so that the residents have a one uh, stop shop as we migrate out of this building for construction okay, okay. any other discussion alderperson donahue and just to add, I, I mean, I think we are being a little bit more planful about it than just using it as, as something for the renovation because then it'd be pretty expensive. I think it's really kind of a strategically located piece of land. We talk about how the city grows. Cities not only grow by expanding their territory, but by using the land and the opportunities that they have within their boundaries. And I think this is an excellent <coughs> example of how we can improve the density of what happens in downtown Sheboygan to expand tax base and to make and to and to actually grow the city so I, I think this is a terrific idea beyond just you know the renovation piece of it thank you uh, administrator Hoffland I guess I'd like to add a little bit to the financial aspect of this uh, purchase uh, the city as it uh, considered uh, possible rent uh, during the time of renovation of this structure comparing it to the acquisition cost uh, we would have incurred over 25% of the purchase price in rent for our 12-month period of time, or uh, 12, to, uh, 12 to 16 month period of time. So the thought was to take advantage and uh, acquire, especially since it's adjacent to our existing city hall, 
and it will give us the flexibility, as Mr. Pelichek uh, identified earlier, uh, to either consider it for municipal use or to use it uh, for purposes of redevelopment or, or business attraction. Thank you. Any other discussion? Ask the clerk to call the roll. Fourteen eyes. Motion passes. Item 7.2 is resolution number 38 of 178 by Alderperson Wolf authorizing the purchase of 606 North 9th Street, the former Social Security office, for the future use by the city. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to accept and adopt. Second. And, pa and pass resolution. Sorry. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Fourteen eyes. Motion passes. Other matters received after the agenda was published. City Attorney. 8.1 is an RO submitting various license applications for the period ending December 31, 2017, June 30, 2018, and June 30, 2019. That will be referred to the Lawn Licensing Committee. 8.2 is an RO received by the City Clerk submitting a communication from Roger Miller, Town of Wilson Plan Commission Chairperson, regarding the Kohler Company annexation petition in the Town of Wilson. That will lie over. Uh, next, we have a discharge from the committee, the whole uh, motion. Um, if these first two items, 9-1 and 9-2, are passed, then we can talk about 9-3 and 9-4. Otherwise, we won't be able to. So. The, uh, the first motion is to discharge the Committee of the Whole regarding RC number 60 of 1718 by Finance and Personnel Committee, to whom is referred RO number 19 of 1718 by the Director of Human Resources and Labor Relations and the Fire Chief submitting a report on the audit and review of the Fire Department's job descriptions, the identification of any overlapping duties and responsibilities and recommendations resulting from the study. Alderperson Donahue. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, we have a second. Any discussion on the motion? Would the, then would the clerk please call the roll? We have a John. Dang. John? Uh, I guess I have a, a question for the city attorney. If, 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 if we didn't want to discharge this, could, could we file it? You can't do anything with it unless it's discharged. It's currently at the committee of the whole. Okay. So, so the committee so of the whole. So, so it has to be discharged. Well, that's up to you. You can leave it in the committee of the whole if you wish for them to do for you as them. Okay. To do so, for you. okay. Then my question would be if, if we discharge it, then we have to act <coughs> on it afterwards? If you discharge it, then you, it is on the agenda for you to do something with. Then, I could, then we could file that. You could. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Alderperson Boren, did you have your I just on? had a question. I guess I asked, I uh, wanted to ask the chairman of the uh, committee of the whole what the rationale is for discharging these. I don't even know if, if she discharge or made the request, but what's the rationale for discharging these maybe without having, trying to have another attempt to have a committee of the whole meeting? Alderperson Donahue? Um, I actually did try twice, and I was frankly somewhat surprised that I only heard from about half of the alders and could not determine on two attempts whether we could get a quorum or not. Uh, from that, I inferred that people didn't want to talk about it at the <coughs> Committee of the Whole, and they would be happy to talk about it at a city council meeting. From my perspective, either is fine. Um, the advantage to the Committee of the Whole is that we have more extended time for people to discuss matters. We are not limited to the rule that we only get to speak twice uh, on a matter, which sometimes is violated in the breach here, but nonetheless, um, uh, so I was thinking maybe it's summer, people just aren't into figuring out their calendars. I just wasn't sure what was going on. So um, if we want to not discharge this and take it back to, 
while I think this is a matter that needs to be addressed, it's not urgent. And, uh, and it's something that we could spend more time on. So it's really up to, up to the council's pleasure about what you want to do. I'm happy to have the committee of the whole meeting. Uh, that's fine with me. So whatever folks want to do. Thank you for those comments. Alderperson Holshue. Thank you. Can you tell me what I need to do to send it back to committee of the whole and not discharge it? Then you, you, you vote, vote no. no. You would vote no on what we're talking about. Just checking. Thanks. Alder person Boren? Ah, that's basically You're good? what I was. Okay. Yeah, I'm good. Okay, so then uh, I sense no more votes. Would the clerk call the roll for discharge? Okay, so if you vote yes, you're voting to discharge committee of the whole and handle it tonight. If you vote no, you're putting it back in committee of the whole for this one document. Okay. Two eyes, 12 no's. Motion's defeated. Okay, let me go to 9.2. 9.2, then it's before us. Uh, motion to discharge the Committee of the Whole regarding resolution number 30 of 1718 by Alderperson Bellinger, authorizing the purchasing agent to enter into a contract for professional services related to the performance of the operation and, uh, and departmental structure of the Sheboygan Fire Department. Alderperson Donahue. So move. Is there a second? Okay, second? we have. Who seconded? I'm sorry. Alderperson Sorensen. Under discussion, Alderperson Bellinger. Thank you. I, I would uh, recommend that we do just what we did with the previous document and vote no for this and send it back to the committee of the whole. Um, I spoke with Alderman Donahue prior to this meeting, and, and like she stated earlier, that she is amenable to have a meeting. So um, if everybody were to be so polite <coughs> as to reply to her when she sends out an email um, that that would be greatly appreciated um, I mentioned to her that I could speak to this issue for 45 minutes to an hour but I don't think anybody wants to listen to that tonight and I would like to have the um, uh, the gentleman Steve Knight from uh, Fitch and Associates who did the presentation and who was selected by the city administrator in the committee to uh, move forward with the study um, and have him here in present so that he could give his presentation. Uh, those of you that will remember that when he did his presentation before, there were um, technical difficulties and it was very cumbersome and he wasn't able to give his PowerPoint presentation the way he intended it. Uh, so I think it would be uh, nice to have him back and be able to speak to the depth of his organization, the depth that the study would, would entail and um, in the expertise that they have in this specific area. So I would urge um, everybody to, to vote no so it can go back to the committee of the whole and be properly vetted, especially seeing as we have a new council and we have new aldermen uh, to get the history behind what has transpired and why we're at this point where we're at. So thank you. Thank you for those comments. Alderperson Trester. Um, it seems to me that a few minutes ago um, we were talking about uh, borrowing and why this is coming up again. And I guess I have the same question. We have voted this down twice. So why are we going over it again and again? Or is this going to be something that is going to be brought up over and over and over again? Every time the council votes it down, we're going to bring it up and hope that somebody will change their vote. Personally, I think it's a waste of time. Thank you for those comments. Alderperson Sorensen. My question is going back to, I guess, if we don't discharge this, what's, what's the plan moving forward to schedule a committee of the whole meeting? Because I think it is frustrating when only half the council fills out a doodle poll. I think maybe, you know, we have 14 folks here tonight, uh, maybe setting a, a date for the committee of the whole meeting tonight before the end of the meeting, or just pick, you know, another Monday that's not, uh, on the same Monday as a council meeting. That would just be my recommendation. Thank you for those comments. Any other discussion? See no further discussion. Will the clerk please call the roll for discharge? Okay, Alderman Bellinger explained it really well. All you're doing is voting yes 
to discharge or no not to discharge and put it back in the community hall? One aye, 13 no's. Motion's defeated. Other person, Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to adjourn. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. All those in favor of adjournment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? We stand adjourned. Thank you very much.